On this episode of This Week in Space, we're going to visit a metal asteroid with Lindy Elkins-Tanton, principal investigator of the Psyche Asteroid Mission. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 73, recorded on August 4th, 2023, Heavy Metal in Space. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Discourse, the online home for your community. Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and collaborate anytime, anywhere. Visit discourse.org slash twit to get one month free on all self-serve plans. And by Bitwarden, get the open source password manager that can help you stay safe online. You can get started with a free Teams or Enterprise plan trial, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Heavy Metal Edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and I'm here today with guest co-host, very special guest co-host, Daniel Suarez, New York Times best-selling author of a number of books. Hello, Daniel. Hello, it's great to be here. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we're honored to be speaking with Dr. Lindy Elkins-Tanton, the principal investigator for NASA's Psyche mission to the asteroid of the same name. Hello, and how are you, Lindy? Great today. Thanks so much for inviting me on. Thank you for coming. Uh, before we begin, of course, we have a space joke, a witheringly bad one this time, with apologies in advance. Hey, Daniel. Yes. What did Bruce Willis say when he saw an asteroid heading for Earth? I do not know. Armageddon out of here. <laughs> I told you it was a stinker. Oh, I got a rib shot anyway. Brad. As always, we invite everybody to send us your best and worst space joke. We love them all, and we do use them with credit to you. Also, don't forget to do us a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and all that good podcast stuff. After all, we're free. Now on to a couple of quick headlines. Goodbye, Voyager, question mark. Fortunately not. After a tumultuous launch in 1977, a victorious transit of the solar system through the 21st century, and a triumphant entry into interstellar space in 2018, voyagers are living on borrowed time. 46 years in, their power supplies are dwindling, instruments are aging, and they still move further away every second. Voyager 2 is currently about 12.5 billion miles from Earth. And on July 21st, was sent an erroneous command in its programming update that skewed its antenna slightly off axis in relation to Earth, only about two degrees, but that was enough. On Tuesday, NASA said it had detected a heartbeat in the spacecraft, which is good news, from its very small, low-wattage radio transmitter. And that signal, just for those who were keeping track of the numbers, is operating below its original 22 to 23 watts, and the signal is now about 10 to the minus 18th attowatts, which is a unit of measure I hadn't even heard of before I read this headline. NASA's working the problem. In any case, Voyager has a fail-safe routine installed that should kick in sometime in October, cause the spacecraft to automatically start seeking radio signals from Earth and put it back on track. Bear in mind, the entire yearly Voyager program budget is just under six to seven million dollars, or about the cost of a nice condo in Malibu in California, so it's a heck of a deal. Next up, transatlantic space. Voyager Space, not affiliated with the probe. This is a private company. Helmed by a friend of our show, Dylan Taylor, is partnering with European aerospace giant Airbus to develop their Starlab private space station. This transatlantic partnership may provide benefits beyond engineering and fabrication. The 49% minimum ownership by European entities may also make it easier for European nations to fly their own astronauts aboard that private station once it's in orbit. In the past, there's been some reluctance to do so with entirely U.S.-owned entities. Uh, ESA had been considering flying on the Chinese Tiangong Modular Space Station at one point, but recently decided not to, leaving private stations like Starlab and Blue Origin's Orbital Reef, which will be aug first augmenting the International Space Station, then replacing it after it goes out of use in 2030. So this is good news for everybody concerned. All right, we'll be getting into it in a moment, right after this quick break to hear from our sponsor. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Discourse, the online home for your community. For over a decade, Discourse has made it their mission to make the internet a better place for online communities. By harnessing the power of discussion, real-time chat, and AI, Discourse makes it easy to have meaningful conversations and collaborate with your community anytime and anywhere. 
Would you like to create a community? Visit discourse.org slash twit to get one free month on all self-serve plans. Trusted by some of the largest companies in the world, Discourse is open source and powers more than 20,000 online communities. Whether you're just starting out or want to take your community to the next level, there's a plan for you. There's a basic plan for private invite-only community, a standard plan if you want unlimited members and a public presence, and a business plan for active customer support communities. Jonathan Balaba, developer advocacy at Twitch, says Discourse is the most amazing things we've ever used. We have never experienced software so reliable, ever. And that's a heck of an endorsement. One of the biggest advantages to creating your own community with Discourse is that you own your own data. You will always have access to all your conversation history, and Discourse will never sell your data to advertisers. Discourse gives you everything you need in one place. Make Discourse the online home for your community. Visit discourse.org slash twit to get one free month on all self-serve plans. That's discourse.org slash twit. Welcome back. Lindy, could you give us kind of a brief rundown of what the Psyche Mission is all about? Well, we as humans, we've gone to planetary bodies that are made of rock and that are made of ice and big gas giants. And what we've never seen is a metal surface. And amazingly, there seem to be just a few small bodies, asteroids out there in our solar system that actually have metal surfaces. And so this will be our very first time, it's fundamental exploration to a new kind of object. That is the, the headline kind of a start to think about why we're going to this place. That's a pretty good headline. And what makes Psyche so special? Well, it, one of the things that we're constantly asking ourselves uh, as scientists is, how do we get here? What are we doing here on Earth? What about life? How did it happen? And part of that is, how do you build a habitable planet? And one of the really important parts of the Earth is our metal core that creates our magnetic field that helps to shade, uh, to, um, shade our atmosphere and uh, allows us to navigate and all the other nice things that a magnetic field does. But we can't ever visit the core of our Earth or the metal cores of any of the other rocky bodies. But we think that Psyche, this asteroid, might be a piece of the metal core of a little tiny planet, a planetesimal that never joined in with the other rocky planets, but instead got stranded in the asteroid belt. And so this is our hope as a species to see a metal core, to go see a metal core, to see our inner space. We have to go to outer space, as we say. <laughs> That's very cool. And uh, just to uh, walk back for one moment, I'd like to get sort of an overview of how you got to where you are today. Mm. Uh, you got your Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and PhD from MIT, I gather, which is I did, yeah. quite an achievement. Um, and then went on through a professorship on into the kind of work you're doing now. So can you give us a little more detail on that path? Yeah, I, that, the way you said it is really nice. I kind of like it that way because <laughs> the truth of it is much curvier and more sort of difficult. After my master's, I, uh, I was really curious about the business world, which seems like a big part of the world, bigger than academia. And uh, so I went and worked as a management consultant and I wrote business plans for a while. And then I thought, I want to always be able to challenge myself in a bigger and bigger way. And I love to teach. And so then I decided to go back from my doctorate. But the, the part of the story that I think it's important to tell there, two parts. One is that that time in business was incredibly useful. These are things that usually academics don't get taught. Budgeting and forecasting and negotiations and HR issues and risk tolerance. And these are the things that actually make up my life now running this mission. And then the other part, which I think is important to share, is that I didn't go back to start my PhD till I was 31. So I was 10 years behind my cohort. And I was not uh, a picture of success at that moment. I was a single mother and I was dealing with anxiety and depression. And when I went back to grad school, my, my son, um, who's now all grown up and fabulous, you know, he started kindergarten the same day that I started grad school. And so I just like to share that story and it kind of motivated me to write my memoir because I think the truth of everyone's life is that it's a roller coaster of successes and failures and ups and downs and moments where you look shiny and moments where you don't. And so if you just tell my story like three degrees from MIT and now she runs a space mission, it sounds kind of straightforward, which it totally is not. So that's that's a little more of the background of how I got to where I am. Lindy, I have a question. Uh, the Psyche mission plan includes a precision mapping of the asteroid's gravity field. Mm. At present, what do we know 
about Psyche's gravity field. And do you anticipate <laughs> any any mass concentrations that might make a stable or, orbit difficult? And, and yes, you do adjust. And, and I know that's digging right into the technicals of it. I just I'm just curious. That's oh, why we that's, have you here, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, you got right to it. And this is the part no, that is almost like the most fun. No, I wouldn't expect you to. I want you to, you know, all the things, you know what, what we're doing. So, so what do we know about its gravity field? Pretty much nothing. Okay. Uh, recall that uh, we don't even have any pictures of Psyche, really. I mean, there's a sort of super blurry, like blurry thing. It's about four pixels in, um, in the Hubble Space Telescope. And we've started looking at it with uh, James Webb, but not with the imager, with the spectrometer, try to learn more about its composition, which is kind of cool. We have these shape models that people make by looking at how light and radar um, shine off of Psyche as it rotates. So we get a little idea of its shape. I always say it's shaped like a potato, which is safe because potatoes come in lots of shapes. And so whatever it ends up being, it's shaped like a potato. The point is, it's not a sphere. Yeah. And, at, and as and your question is pointing at really one of the most challenging parts of this mission, which is we think that Psyche has got metal on its surface and it has to contain a large amount of metal in its body, but we don't know how it's distributed. Mm -hmm. What if we've got something like a potato and this end is made of metal and this end is made of rock? This end is twice as dense as this end. So this end has so much more gravity than this end. So the gravity field around the body is gonna be weird. So how do you plot a stable orbit that will allow your spacecraft to keep going around and around stably for a long time? And NASA quite reasonably says, you've got to find orbits that are going to be stable for, for weeks, because what if you lose control or you lose communications for some reason that is temporary, your spacecraft has got to be okay without you. And so we know very little about its uh, gravity field, except that we don't expect it to be simple. And so one of the things we did, because we wanted to make sure that when we got there, no matter what the mass concentrations were like, and that high density metal and that low density rock and the funny shape, we want to make sure that we can get down really low, which we need to in the end to get the best compositions. So we ran what are called Monte Carlo uh, experiments. We, we, we made a Psyche model and then we made it as bizarre as it could be in every parameter axis that still fit the data that we actually have. And then we tried a thousand different of those weird pretend psyches to make sure we could always find a low orbit that was stable and we always could. So if that's true, we're good. Do you anticipate that it will be when you uh, get into the vicinity of the asteroid, will you be like all hands to try to figure out what the reality of the situation is and then <laughs> a series of orbits? <laughs> yeah, so we're starting far out and um, anyone who's listening here, whoever took basic physics, do you remember how lovely it was to just assume the mass was a point instead of giving the mass any kind of shape? So we're going to assume the asteroid is a point mass will be far enough out that the gravity field will be like that. And we've got a pretty good idea of what Psyche's mass is in total. So we know what its total gravity is. And so we'll start way out far away in orbit A and then we'll gradually step down as we know the gravity field better and better. And um, we've got some spectacular people working on our gravity calculations, including Maria Zuber at MIT and In Su Jun at JPL. And so uh, I, I really trust these great minds to, to uh, firm up that gravity field in time for us to take the next step lower. Very cool. Very cool. So Lydia, you'd kind of mentioned this earlier, but I was wondering if you give us a little more detail on the relationship, the, the proposed relationship between a mass like Psyche and uh, metallic planetary cores and maybe how magnetic dynamos work? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, let's go back uh, 4.568 billion years to the very first solids in our solar system. There were little pebbles and little sand grains that were coming out of the, the dust and gas that was the nebula around our sun. And very, very quickly, all right, so imagine that that 4.568 billion years was just a 24 hour day. Within the first about 15 seconds of that day, bodies that we call planetesimals had formed. These are things that look like tiny planets, but they're the size of a, of a city or a continent. And they were really kind of the marbles that, that collided together and accreted together to form the big rocky planets. And the reason I'm telling you this story from all the way back then is because some of those planetesimals heated up so much that they melted. And when they melted, the little pieces of metal and the pieces of rock that were intimately mixed in the original material, the metal 
ran to the middle and formed met metallic cores. And so even way back then, the structure of a rocky planet was a metallic core with a rocky outside, the same as the Earth, the same as Venus and Mercury and the Moon and Mars all have a metal core and a rocky outside um, because of this melting process that allows the metal to run to the middle. And so on our Earth, we have a solid inner core made of metal and the um, and you have got a, uh, a, a liquid outer core of liquid metal. And that liquid outer core is convecting like a bowl of oatmeal, like a, a pot of boiling oatmeal. And that convection creates the magnetic field. And the magnetic field is made by moving conduits of, of material that could act like an electric current, which the metal can. And so that's why the Earth has a magnetic field. And we think the same thing happened on many planetesimals. They also formed magnetic fields with their little tiny cores. And so maybe you've got the picture now that we have a sort of a parallelism between these little tiny baby beginning planetesimals having metal cores and dynamos, just like our Earth. And so if Psyche is the metal part of Psyche is part of the core of a planetesimal, we have a hope that maybe it had recorded its magnetic field. It would not have a dynamo anymore. It's all cold. Not like Pluto. You know, we went to Pluto and surprise, it was still alive. It was losing heat and things were happening. Psyche is going to be very cold all the way through. Um, but it still could have that magnetic field recorded in the metal. And so that's one of the first measurements we're going to be making. Very cool. And actually, I was going to ask another question, but one just occurred to me. How long do you think it took for uh, that core to cool off? Are we talking 50 million years or more for mm. something this size? Yeah, so a lot of different models on this that that all of us theorists love to love to make and uh, say that Psyche was formed in less than a million years after the first solids in the solar system. That's likely um, that you are exactly right. That magnetic dynamo, the cooling process, and part of it would be um, through the magnetic dynamo and the convection of that core could have lasted 50 million years or even possibly longer, uh, wow. which is kind of amazing. You think of this tiny object in space, you think it would cool really fast, but with a Deep cold outside. Yeah, no, that's really, really true. Yeah, we don't have a good instinct for that. You are so right. Hey, Rod, can I ask my real question now? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> two in a Go row. Go for it. I interrupted myself. Uh, Go for it. Lindy, a lot of media that covers 16 Psyche seems to focus on the perceived 10 it's quintillion hilarious. dollar value of the resources. <laughs> yes. And that's if they were returned to Earth, which is, of course, clearly not practical. Yeah. Are headlines like this more of a distraction to your team, or is the extra publicity nonetheless helpful? I kind of like it. You, you know, there there are so many reasons for humans to be interested in space exploration. And, and to me, the two most important ones are inspiration about a positive future and the knowledge that if we can do this thing, if we can build this robot that is so complicated that no single person on the team understands how it works, but it's going to work in space for decades, like think about Voyager, we have the ability to solve our problems on Earth. It's just a teamwork issue. So those two things are huge for me about space flight. And so no matter what angle people are coming at to be interested in space, I'm really happy to support that. But as you say, uh, so Psyche, if it were possible, first of all, to bring Psyche back to Earth, we have zero technology to do that. Not even close. Never, Sounds never, like never. It. it is super far away, right? Um, so when Psyche is at its, uh, see if I get these numbers right. If the Psyche is at its closest to the Earth, it's something like uh, 250 million kilometers. And when it's farthest, around 650. And that's... Um, Oh, gosh, about at its closest, it's still about four times as far away as Mars gets to us. And so the, the point is, we cannot bring Psyche to the Earth. It's not going to happen. Even if we could, Helen, we probably. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah, you're so right. It makes no sense. And if we did bring it, we probably would like not get it quite in the right parking orbit and we would make a big mistake and cause the Earth a lot of damage. Yeah, and then if, even if we could, and this is just an important point to make, too we would collapse the global metal markets and then the metal would be worth zero. And so that is a falsehood in every single possible way. Um, but I've had very funny conversations about even Smithsonian and Forbes, they have covered this story that way um, because it catches people's eye. It's a good headline, I guess. It's a good headline and it has no truth in it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, on that note, on that excellent note, we will be back with my next question right after this short break. Stay with us. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden, the only open source cross-platform password manager anywhere, anytime. Security Now's Steve Gibson has even switched over. With Bitwarden, all the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. In the summer 2023 G2 Enterprise Grid Report, they solidified their position as the highest performing password manager for the enterprise, leaving competitors in the dust. Bitwarden protects your data and privacy by adding strong randomly generated passwords for each account. And you can go further with the username generator. Create unique usernames for each account or use any of the five integrated email alias services. Transparently view all of Bitwarden's code available on GitHub. On top of being public to the world, Bitwarden also has professional third-party audits performed yearly and the results get published on their website. Bitwarden is open source security that you can trust. Share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. Bitwarden's Teams organization option is $3 per month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 per month per user. And individuals always get Bitwarden's basic free account for unlimited passwords. Upgrade any time to a premium account for less than $1 per month or bring the whole family with their family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Bitwarden has launched its new Bitwarden Secrets Manager, which is soon coming out of beta. Secrets Manager keeps those sensitive developer secrets out of source code and eliminates the risk of public exposure. And right now, our friends at Bitwarden want to hear why you love your password manager. They're offering cash prizes and a short video contest. Visit bitwarden.com slash talent to learn how to enter and win. Find examples, rules, and submission instructions and enter by August 13th, 2023. At Twit, we're fans of password managers. Get started with Bitwarden's free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. All right, I'm jumping ahead in my questions now because of Daniel's excellent question. Um, okay. So, you know, speaking of, of the utilization of the metals on Psyche, uh, it's a lot, ultimately, once the infrastructure is there, it's potentially, we think, a lot cheaper to start building things in space than building them on Earth and launching them there mm -hmm. because nature's already done us the favor of putting a bunch of metal out there. And it's probably, I would suppose, not being a scientist, easier to utilize something that's in a cohesive mass in an asteroid like Psyche than to try and gather up all the junk and that's ricocheting around orbit and smelt that down being differentiated metals and paints and all kinds of insulation and so forth. Um, do you have any opinions about the viability of utilizing the resources on something like Psyche in the, in the future and maybe when? Yeah. Yeah, I really want us to use space resources and the metals are uh, one of the top targets for this um, would not be psyche too far away, but there are earth crossing and near earth asteroids that seem to be made of metal that would be good uh, candidates to go to. And uh, I keep thinking of Neil Stevenson's book, Seven Eves, which you two might have read, right. where he has a, the swarm of little mining robots that pick pieces of metal off the piece of the metal meteorite in order to um, uh, use that metal in the in the spacecraft. And I kind of love that model. Um, and one other thing about your point about orbital debris, we've got to collect that and there certainly is economic value in it, but there's also big security risks letting other people have all the bits of your old satellite. So there's so many different challenges with that. So using orbital debris is one thing, but the thing we've got to absolutely do is figure out how to clean it up. So, uh, so yeah, I think asteroid resources would be great. Sensational. Lindy, if NASA's budget expanded significantly are there other asteroid missions you'd like to launch and if so what would they be and and more broadly what do you think our priorities should be deep space exploration yeah that's a great question um the interesting thing about asteroids is I think in our kind of like reptilian subbrain, we think every asteroid is like every other asteroid, just like that asteroid field they have to go through in in, in Star Wars. Every asteroid looks like it's the same stuff. And it turns and out we're all every close asteroid together. 
And, right, which is, it's, it's such a vivid image, we can't get it out of our heads, but it is absolutely not the case out there in space. Uh, and so uh, every time we go to an asteroid, we learn something completely new about the origins of our solar system. Um, personally, I think that I would go back to Ceres and try to understand what those sort of ice features seem to be and what that body is made of. And that's also uh, potentially a future resource kind of exploration. Lindy, uh, there's a package aboard your spacecraft called the Laser Communications Experiment, which is quite exciting as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that's for and what the implications might be for the future of robotic exploration? Yes. Yeah, we're very we are very honored to be flying the deep space orbital communications package, which uh, is practicing communicating with Earth using lasers instead of radio waves. It turns out you can encode a lot more information in a laser than you can in a radio wave. And this is really a preparation for, um, frankly, human settlement on Mars. It's uh, we joke that it's the way we're going to stream movies to Mars using laser comms. And uh, there have been laser comm experiments before, but this time we actually get to practice from the distance of Mars. And uh, and so there are going to be a whole bunch of different times during our trajectory as we after we leave the Earth and long before we get to Psyche, where that deep space orbital communications is going to be turned on and it will be communicating using its laser with um, there is a sending site and a receiving site in California. And uh, one of the things I love about this is that the receiver they built is made of superconducting nanowires. And so these tiny wires are held um, very, very close to absolute zero so that the energy of a single incoming photon from the laser on the Psyche spacecraft hitting that little wire warms it up enough that it becomes not superconducting and they immediately know they had a hit and then they cool it down again. And so the whole thing is just a tech geek's dream, I have to say. One photon? Yes, isn't that absolutely unbelievable? That is, yeah. that's brain bending. It is, to, I love it so much, yeah. So as long as we're talking about instrumentation, maybe you give us a rundown in layman's terms of the other instruments and uh, the propulsion system. Absolutely. Uh, this is one of the ironies of designing spacecraft. And I know that some of you know this, and I was just living it, you know, real time with the Psyche mission that making a spacecraft that will take your science instruments where it needs to go is so complicated and so expensive that you constantly have to defend a little bit of mass and a little bit of money and a little right. bit of energy to actually put your science instruments on that spacecraft. Great and space. so right from the beginning, yeah. So right from the beginning, we planned the absolute minimum and perfect set of instruments instruments that we possibly could to try to answer our questions. So there's nothing extra. Um, of course, we're flying imagers. You got to know what it looks like. And uh, and I'll add while we're just talking about imagers that we already have the data pipeline built so that the pictures that come in from Psyche across the deep space network, we're going to put them on the internet free for the world to look at within a half hour of our receipt. We're not going to edit them. We're not going to do anything to them. We're going to share the genuine experience straight away. So look forward to those pictures. So imagers, and they will have spectra on them uh, or filters so that we can look at particular spectra of images and we'll learn something about composition that way. Then there are the magnetometers. Um, we have two uh, magnetometers that will measure any magnetic field that's at Psyche, and we hold them on a boom off from the spacecraft so the spacecraft field itself doesn't interfere. Then we have this uh, super sophisticated, amazing instrument called a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. And uh, this is, uh, I don't know how much time you want me to talk about this. I'm going to give you the short story, but it's another one of those <laughs> geek out moments. It's cool. Um, yeah. It uses this softball sized green colored germanium crystal to detect gamma rays coming off the surface of psyche which happens because psyche has no atmosphere and every gamma ray has an energy that's specific to the atom that released it and so by measuring these gamma rays we will know the atomic proportions of the composition of the surface of the asteroid so that's a beautiful thing for composition and then finally we will do that um, uh, gravimetry experiment and get the gravity field and that's by using using the regular comms antenna and the Doppler effect of radio waves back and forth. So that's our whole science suite. Um, and then in short, the other part of your question was about propulsion system. Mm -hmm. 
So we're, we're what's called solar electric propulsion. Uh, we have these amazing solar arrays, five panels on each side that will unfold, that will unfold perfectly after launch and, uh, and form um, a spacecraft that's almost 25 meters across. So it's about the size of a single tennis court once those are unfolded. And Earth distance from the sun, we'll get 20 kilowatts from these solar panels. And when we're out by Psyche, it's more like uh, two and uh, two kilowatts. And that's enough to do everything we need. So our propulsion system, then we take that energy and we use the energy to ionize, to strip ion, to strip electrons off atoms of the noble gas xenon. That's our propellant. So we'll fly over a thousand kilograms of xenon. And then that xenon will be accelerated through magnetic fields and at, in a little thruster, you know, they're not that big, like dinner plate size, accelerate those ionized xenon atoms out the back of the spacecraft. And that is the transfer of momentum that moves the spacecraft. This particular kind of thruster is called Hall effect. This is the first time that Hall effect ion thrusters have been used outside of Earth Moon orbit. And they are the perfect solution to trying to go far away from the Earth on what's considered a relatively tight budget. That's really exciting. Um... I just wanted to mention that aside, I, I knew a gentleman named uh, Robert Layton who worked at Caltech back in the old days, early days of the space race. And uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to speak to him years ago about Mariner 4. Mm. And he was one of the prime movers on getting a camera installed in that spacecraft. It was originally <sighs> going to be like Mariner 2 and just bring back squiggly line science. And he said, can you even imagine? You yeah. have to show the public what you're doing. And what a difference that made. I mean, that was surely the big headline from that spacecraft. That's everything. Can you talk a little bit about um, how NASA slash JPL works together with uh, schools like yours to run these missions? Because this is something that you didn't see 30, 40 years ago. Mm, yeah, these competed missions. So the kind of missions that most of us think about from NASA are, are what are called flagship missions, like the Mars rovers or the upcoming Europa Clipper. Um, you know, these are missions that are conceived of out of the decadal survey and run out of headquarters. Um, but then there are slightly smaller missions that are competed. And those are led by scientists, in this case, myself, um, to conceive of where to go and why we would go there. What's the science? and then to help put together the team. You need a NASA center to manage the mission and you need an industry partner to build the spacecraft chassis. And then you need all your science partners and your instrument partners and the subcontractors. So you get this ocean of organizations and you put together a proposal. For us, we started working on this project in 2011. And in 2014, we submitted our step one proposal that was 240 page proposal written by about 50 people. And uh, we competed against 27 other missions and we got down selected to five, which was so exciting. And then we got a little bit of money for the first time and we wrote our thousand page concept study report and we did a whole bunch of other, I mean, that year was just oh, wow. the most exciting and madness year of my life and, and incredible. Um, although I think this year is going to overtake that one. <laughs> uh, and so by then we had 140 people on the team and uh, then we were selected for flight. So for us, it was six years, which is about the quickest you could ever hope to go through this process. And it is a very serious commitment, even to propose is a huge commitment. And then you start building. And um, I'm so glad I had that business experience. It's really helped. I have a lot of opinions about how teams should run and how important team norms are and the way people treat each other and making sure every voice is heard. You know, it's very common in gigantic teams, especially ones in aerospace that have a little bit of a military side to them. You know, we are not military, but it's that whole culture of the whole industry um, that sometimes the people who are authentically the junior people on the team holding the soldering iron, writing the line of code, their voice doesn't get heard a lot. But if you don't allow them to speak up when something is wrong and support them and listen to them, you will never know what's wrong in time to fix it. And so things like that end up being the big decisions that a PI needs to do, kind of creating this team that's going to be as high functioning as possible um, when you have a lot of responsibility and not necessarily direct authority. So it's a really interesting kind of ecosystem that we build. Well, after writing that plan, I think your book is going to be a snap <laughs> <laughs> for two reasons, shorter and probably an easier audience by definition. Yeah, that's uh, right. We'll be right back uh, with Daniel's next question as soon as we take this short break. Stay with us.
Okay, Lindy, how do you think the advent of commercial deep space exploration is likely to impact what NASA does mm. in the near term and the long term? And are there considerations you'd like addressed by policymakers and entrepreneurs? Oh, my goodness. Oh, how many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear what you think about that, Take Danny. You time. must have oh, amazing. I, I, have, I, I want to hear you first. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go first. And then the I want to hear what after that. Yeah, I do. I want to hear your response. Well, I will just say that the first thing I can say is a personal anecdote about this, which is that uh, we are launching on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy. And um, it is indeed those reusable side boosters, the ones that just launched Jupiter 2 last week, are going to be back on the Psyche Space spacecraft um, rocket in in October. So that will be the fourth time that those have been used. And because of the success of SpaceX's rocket program, um, they saved the federal government quite a lot of money on the launch. And so that is a really interesting situation where competition suddenly from the private sector is changing the structure of how the government puts together missions. And um, I think in general, it's a really, really positive thing because uh, science happens uh, really only because governments fund it. You know, we like to think that Darwin's expedition on the Beagle was an expedition of science, but of course it wasn't. It was a commercial expedition and Darwin went along to keep the the captain company. And so <laughs> that's the story with science unless governments get involved. Um, but with commercial uh, involvement, we'll have a lot more opportunity. And And so that's all I'll say about that part. And then the policy part, the really hard part is who owns what in space and how will we behave toward each other once we're up there? You know, can we please stop space exploration from being a proxy for war like it's been in the past? And what happens when on Mars there are side by side settlements? One is China and one is Elon Musk. Are they going to be best friends because they're much closer to each other than they are to their home bases back on Earth? Those are the kinds of policy questions I think are really facing us and our future as a species, frankly. Interesting. And and in terms of my opinion about it, and I'll be very brief, but part of the research I was doing for my, my series of books, I at one point was talking to a mining lobbyist and he was talking to me about remote mining and uh, I think some petroleum operations. And one of the things he said surprised me. He said, when you're out in a remote area, very often competitors become uh, allies because they there have to go. operate out in this very dangerous area. And if there's a problem, they need to rely on each other. And I'm hopeful, and I, I don't know about you, but I'm hopeful that as this opens as a new frontier, that there will be a spirit of camaraderie like that. And, and perhaps so even the great. overview effect as we yes. see how completely isolated and, and precious this yes. jewel of earth is. Uh, that's me being hopeful. Uh, let's I hope love that. that. I love that. And, and frankly, I think that we all have to be hopeful and we have to not be cynical because as soon as you're pessimistic and cynical, there is no possible positive future. Yeah. So yeah. thank you yeah, for you that. You have to imagine it before you can do it. And it's better yeah. to imagine a positive thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a really interesting turn of conversation. I, I read a lot in this area as well. And of course, there's, as you pointed out a lot of conversation about resource utilization of space and who owns what and how that works with the existing treaties and so forth. And there's been some pushback on this in the past decade, but it, it still seems to me from, from just a journalist standpoint that the Antarctic model is a really good one. Uh, it doesn't have a commercial component per se, but a variety of stations operating around the continent that tend to, in very general terms, collaborate at the U.S. South Pole Station for research mm -hmm. and uh, collaboration. And then they can go back to their own national entities to eat the food they like, to be with the people who speak the same language and so forth, exist under their own set of, of legal structures. But that model has worked really well for about 60, 65 years. And uh, the mutual aid that has been offered, especially mm. because you are in this severe situation, makes one think of places like Mars and, and asteroids and so forth. Yeah. And, Am I correct in assuming or, or remembering that that's about to expire, the Antarctic Agreement? Or I don't I, know. Is it? I think it may. Yeah. Yes. I and I, I do think that when you bring in tremendous wealth that's available, that uh, total sense of 
camaraderie might be slightly eroded. And so people use also deep sea mining treaties as, as a good uh, basis. And uh, in fact, um, Kevin Hubbard, who just finished his PhD um, and is now, he's working for Honeybee Robotics, but he's he's worked very hard on policies that might work on the moon. And he used both of those as, as um, uh, you know, progenitor kind of uh, policies. And just to point to another group that's really trying to help us solve this ahead of time, King Charles just revealed his his uh, Astra Carta, kind of based on the idea of the Magna Carta, talking about right. equitable use of space resources. So good for him. You know, we need yeah. to convene these conversations and move them on from exactly this place. I was laughing because I was thinking of the circumstances of the signing of the Magna Carta, and uh, we'll call it a pressure situation. Uh, not Not the case right now. No, exactly. But I guess, right, so it's the Magna Carta, the Foresta Carta, and then there was the Terra Carta, and now there's the Astra Carta. So it uh, seems to be a model they like. <laughs> yes. So okay. we have this kind of interesting convert. This, this is vaguely related to what we're talking about, this kind of conversion of, of uh, convergence of forces happening. We have this increasing sense of, especially in Congress, we're competing with China, we're competing with China, mm. we're competing with China, we're competing with China on the moon. We're competing with China on Mars now, even though we've been there for a very long time and probably beyond. So on the one hand, we've got this notion of we've got to keep up. On the other hand, looking downstream, we may soon have reductions in NASA budgets, which, of course, affects, in my opinion anyway, planetary more than anything, because yeah. some things like the Artemis program are kind of heavily guarded whereas planetary seems to absorb a lot of the cuts over the years, at least that's my observation. And you're already in competition, friendly competition, with other missions and other objectives out there, sure. whether they be in our solar system or or beyond. Uh, any any thoughts on that? It's kind of a big topic to throw at you, but yeah. I think it's yeah, a very that's... real concern. You know, this is exactly where all the different ways that people think about space influences how policy gets made and how decisions get made. And and uh, there's, you know, a fairly small minority of us who are mostly interested in the science. Where do we come from? How do planets get formed? You know, what are other planets can be like? Those amazing questions of, of existence, the like questions of the human mind and what it is to be civilized. There are a lot more people who are much more closely connected to questions of wealth and questions of defense. And so, uh, and so that's where I think that what you're pointing out becomes especially strong when you get to, to Congress. And there is um, exactly so much concern about China and China is leaping ahead in the space game. The amount of money uh, is astonishing that's going in and they're having a lot of successes, which was not always the case with our competitors in space. So we, I think, are facing as a nation um, a bit of a national um, coming to terms with what our space profile is and uh, comes at an interesting time in our country, doesn't it? I wonder, I really would love to hear what each of you thinks about that because that's quite a topic. Yeah, especially with increasing geopolitical. I guess we have to start using the term astropolitical competition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, that leads me to wonder the data, let's say the massive amount of data that your mission will, mm. will produce. Is that going to be made available to the world, of all of science? And how does that generally, in your past experience, work with, with other nations? Do they share as readily as NASA? I've, I've personally found when I was looking at various... Uh, uh, missions and I was trying to get information. NASA is very open about what they they seem to be make great tools to visualize and, and things and that's other right. nations not so much. I don't know whether that's a factor of budget or policy, but but what are your thoughts about that? It, it, from what I personally have experienced, it's a matter of budget and policy. And you're exactly right. Other nations do not make all of their data available in the way that NASA does. And I'm really proud of this that we do as a nation. To me, this is the correct way to be a human being is uh, space exploration is for everyone. And so within a matter of months, all the data that comes down gets loaded into a center that is accessible and it's loaded in different degrees of um, being processed. So if you're a sophisticated user, you can go back to the raw data. And if you are less sophisticated, you'll get something that's easier to look at. I love that. I think that's really important. And um, it reminds me of um, 
Joseph Banks was he 18th century English scientist and uh, he said he said in times when governments are not getting along with each other scientists form bridges that continue the conversation and can keep relationships going and I love that I think it's true and I would say we're um, working on that quite hard in in the group that I that I lead at Arizona State University interplanetary initiative really trying to think about our future from multidisciplinary point of view, because that's what the questions that you're each bringing up, I think, are, are key questions for the future of humanity. How do we get along when we're off this planet and when the stakes are frankly even higher and we can do better? And that's that's what we've got to work on. Well, just to uh, hop back to the logistical part of this for a second, you know, when you're competing with a country like China that has vastly lower labor costs than us and high technical proficiency and then you know, I, I work at JPL every year and I don't earn a lot, but some people there do. It's not a, a cheap thing to do to build and test and fly oh. spacecraft. And I wonder, you know, when a nation like India is coming along, who we're allying with now finally on Artemis, thank goodness, and other things, when you see the cost of the missions they've flown, which have been very successful, they're you know, maybe three to five times less in overall budget. And, mm. it, you know, that's hard to tease out because you've got command and control and mm -hmm. management of the project and so forth. But just on the building of it, what I found fascinating is how cost effective they were. And the fact that I think I read 70% of the labor force is skilled women in that country. Hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. That you Amazing. don't see in a lot of other places. Yeah. So I wonder if, if that kind of alliance would be helpful in the future as we're trying to keep up with the, this perceived race. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I've been thinking about exactly these things quite a lot recently. There's a there's a cultural aspect of this in, in the nations that we see moving towards space. What is the general agreement in the community about what is quality and what is every person's role in quality? And what is the general agreement in the community about agreement of about risk and and also the importance of schedule? <laughs> These things that, uh, you know, all of us type A plus kind of Westerners who are just like, you know, we have to have it on time and it has to be on schedule and all the rest of it. That's the way we've been running our space programs. And maybe there are slightly different cultural models that work in different ways. And I would also point out JAXA coming from um, a country that is uh, traditionally uh, not gigantically speculative risk takers, but instead right. kind of communal thinkers. And JAXA is a speculative risk taker. How did they create a space agency that has done these crazy wild missions and with incredible success? And so I think a lot of it comes to the culture of the community around what's happening and what we're seeing and what you're pointing out with these examples that you brought up is how different models work in different ways. So if I understand correctly, you are only the second woman to lead a project of this type and scope. Is that right? I'm the second woman to compete and win um, okay. a, a competed mission. And now there are a bunch of us, which is great, but I was second. Maria Zuber was first. And there have been women who have become the principal investigator of missions, but they weren't the original principal investigator. So I'm, I'm early in this complicated process and, uh, and, and glad to be a part of it. Absolutely. So if you had a message for young women who are looking to follow in your footsteps, which I think many would love to do, what would it be? Yeah, uh, I have a general message for humans, which is there are so many reasons why any given person might be underestimated um, or why they or the people around them might have implicit bias about whatever characteristic they're choosing about themselves. And so we've got to do our best to let people rise on their merits. And that's a job of every single person. I don't think this is a gendered issue. I think this is an issue of people who come in with confidence and appearance and people who don't, but might have tremendous merit and things to share. And so my biggest message is be as brave as you can be in your life and be as kind as you can be in your life. And I think that those are the ways that everyone gets a chance to try. Okay. I, and I have two closing things I'd like you to address. Tell us what Beagle Learning is. Oh. And tell us more about your books you've got coming. Oh, lovely. Uh, Beagle Learning is an education company um, that my family and uh, and our wonderful co-founder, Carolyn Bickers, started um, based around the idea of inquiry learning, that the best way to learn is for the student to lead the learning. And so we have a process by which students 
learn to learn and it can happen in any uh, topic. And I'll just say briefly that we have a, a software platform that allows this to happen online asynchronously and very successfully. Now we've had um, uh, thousands of students use this, students able to guide their own learning. Um, and it's uh, it's really exciting. It's a lot of fun. So that's Beagle Learning. Um, last year in 2022, my memoir was published by um, by William Morrow. It's called a, a Portrait of the Scientist as a Young Woman. And that's been a really great conversations I've had with people as a result of that. And the point of the writing it was just that all of our lives are complicated. And, and so often in a memoir, it's written as if it's a straight road from childhood to whatever place made a person able to write a book. And it's never the case. And so and so sharing the complexities of real life, I've found to be a pleasure of that. And then uh, some books in the in the pipeline, I hope, but they're not quite uh, at the announcement stage yet. But thank you for asking. Of course. Well, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us today. This has been a lot of fun to talk about the Psyche Mission and beyond. And Lindy, where can we keep up with your activities, both the Psyche Project and the other things you're doing? Oh, love it. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me on. This was a great okay. conversation with the two of you. I really appreciate your time. And uh, so Psyche, we have a, a Psyche website at Arizona State University, which especially has all of our student collaborations. In the last seven years, we've had 1500 college students participate in the project. And then there's a beautiful NASA Psyche site. And so that's the ASU site that's being shown right now. And then I also have uh, a website of my own, Lindy Elkins Tanton, and it talks about my books and other things that I do there so thank you for that invitation and we'll we'll be sure to put those up in the show notes and daniel of course we want to keep an eye on you where should we do that oh yes. well uh daniel-suarez.com and it's daniel suarez at i'm gonna say twitter uh <laughs> it's pretty i know we're in right i know now. right I know, yeah I know. It's just uh, everything's shifting, but th this is an inflection point. So that that's where you keep up with me. And as usual, I'm I'm going to be finishing the trilogy of Delta V. Yay! So amazing. That's what I'm amazing. working on. You're going to be and so I excited. wish you luck on your your novel as well, Lindy. I'm really looking forward to hearing more Thank about you. that. Thank you. I just finished the first complete rough draft, and so we will see what like happens next. I love it. It's my favorite hobby. Yeah. What about you? Well, I, I have to say the great thing about fiction is you don't really have a budget. So, you know, it's not like a NASA program. <laughs> so, for instance, in Delta V, somebody embezzled $24 billion and did stuff in space with it. That I often think what could be accomplished with that amount of money just all in one oh, shot. That's that but, is just by itself a, a, a moment that you want to read the book now. That's right. But the yeah. other thing that I've always loved, and I can't remember who said it, but uh, the big difference between reality and fiction, I always love this was. The difference is that fiction has to make sense. And <laughs> so in some ways it's more work uh, because uh, I, I think both of us can appreciate that from day to day, you look at the news and you're like, really? Yeah. Really? This yeah, is happening like, now? Yes. If I so. wrote that, no one would believe it. So yeah, the fiction exactly. has to actually make exactly. sense. Yeah. Well, and, and next time, that. Daniel, I think the embezzlement has to be larger because when I think of dollars in space, <laughs> I you know, love that. if... If that Mr. sense, the embezzlement has to be large. Well, if Mr. <laughs> Musk could put $44 billion into his uh, SpaceX company, we'd probably be having condominiums on Jupiter, but uh, that's yes. an aside. Yeah, uh, yeah. And of course, mm. you can always find me at pilebooks.com and at astromagazine.com. Please don't forget to drop us a line at twists at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, ideas, and we answer all our email. Also, don't forget to check out space.com, the websites in the name, and the National Space Society also at nss.org, which is also going to uh, help fulfill your space cravings. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so be sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. We'll take five stars or a thumbs up or <laughs> whatever, whatever they ask for. We appreciate it. And you can head to our website at twit.tv slash twists. Finally, don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only found there for just $7 a month, which is a lot less than embezzling $24 billion. <laughs> Finally, you can also follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter, or X, and on Facebook, and Twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Appreciate it.
Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. 